So good morning, everyone. Um, as a user of ANSYS for six years and user, a current user of VMB40 guidelines, it's my honor to introduce you today our next speaker, that is uh, Dr. Mark Horner, with a remarkable career in the field of engineering, particularly within the healthcare industry. Uh, Dr. Horner has made uh, significant contributions to advancement of simulation technology and its applications in medicine. Currently serves as a distinguished engineer at ANSYS, where he leads technical initiatives specifically tailored to the healthcare sector. Um, he obtained his PhD in chemical engineering for Northwestern University in 2001, where he developed a deep understanding of the intersection between engineering and healthcare. And uh, moreover, um, he's an executive committee member of the IMAC Credible Practice and Modeling and Simulation in Healthcare Project. And his dedication to regular science, model credibility, and clinical applications has revolutionized the way we approach healthcare challenges and has the potential to transform the patient care. So today we are privileged to have you here, Mark. So the floor is yours. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Is that, does that help? Okay. All right. Then I don't feel like I'm yelling. But yeah, thanks to everyone here for attending. Um, hopefully I saw a lot of students in the crowd. Um, as a student myself and not seeing myself in this position, certainly uh, 22 years ago when I started my one and only job uh, here at ANSYS, I hopefully, hopefully you see something as, you know, working as a career, in a career as a computational modeler, there are many opportunities. One opportunity we saw with Carmen, working within the pharma industry and doing, you know, PKPD and uh, PBPK type modeling, QSP, et cetera. Uh, another opportunity is certainly working for the simulation software developers. Okay, so today I'll talk about uh, good simulation practice, the past, the present, and the future. And this light can turn down a little or no? In the back? Maybe? <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, what I'd like to talk about then are what are the, what is a good simulation practice and why do we need it? Um, so in general, when we talk about a GXP document, um, what we're referring to is a good practice, and those could be for a variety of areas. Right now we have uh, GXP documents that exist for good laboratory practice, uh, good clinical practice. Um, there's another one I show on the slide related uh, to, um, sorry, good manufacturing process. And these can apply for over a variety of industries. These are primarily regulated industries like uh, cosmetics or food, medical devices, uh, drugs, as you can imagine. Um, and in those cases, what we do is go to the community and look for a consensus in terms of best practices at a high level on a given variety of applications. And so as you can see, a few examples on the slide. Uh, good uh, or GXP documents are published by a number of different organizations. So for example, the World Health Organization published one on biological products, OECD published one on, uh, on uh, good laboratory practices, and then there's one for good clinical practice that comes from, sorry, now I can't remember. I apologize, anyway, I'll figure it out. Okay, I'll get going here in a second. It's still like 4 a.m. where I live. <laughs> so I'll get going, I promise. But what we see and why do we need these GXP documents is that the stakes are rising. Right, more and more we see computational modeling and simulation is being used in these areas where there's increased risk to the patient. And within a conference like this, there's no, absolutely no way I could cover every single application for all of you here and the different perspectives you have and the way you use modeling and simulation. So I just tried to pick a few at a high level um, and those are shown here. So one example is in silico clinical trials. And this is to de-risk the uh, initiation of a clinical trial. And in some cases now, we might even ask ourselves if we do have the ability to use modeling and simulation to predict a clinical endpoint for a medical device or a drug, is it even ethical to not use a model uh, to, before we start exposing our devices or drugs to animals or patients? Another one is virtual patients. And this was a project that uh, took place a few years ago in the US where we worked with the FDA to develop a virtual patient modeling framework and again, we had a model that could predict a clinical endpoint for a medical device and showed how that could be used to replace actual patients in a trial. And one story uh, is where this was used was by Medtronic and they wiped out 25% uh, of the patients in a clinical trial using this virtual patient model. 
And then finally, another one is Digital Twins, and of course, the Edith Project, which is kicking off here in, in the European Union. So uh, the title of my presentation was Good Simulation Practice, the Past, the Present, and the Future. Um, so first, let's talk about the past and what I'll call Welcome to the Wild West. Um, here's a couple of images of a Wild West town, and lo and behold, those are images of a Wild West town that's here in Spain. And so it really shocked me when I said, well, I'll just type in Wild West in Spain and see what comes up while I'm making this presentation. And it turns out some of my favorite spaghetti westerns, which I thought were all made in Italy, were actually made here in southern Spain. And so, yeah, there's this Wild West town, which is way too far away for me to visit tomorrow on my last day here in Spain. Um, but that one day when I come back, I'd love to see because movies like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, uh, for a few dollars more, some of you probably haven't even heard of those movies, but were just absolutely amazing movies and ones I really loved when I was young. So anyway, I thought I would uh, pick on uh, some past modeling um, papers that were published in the literature, but I didn't want to, you know, kind of make anyone feel bad, so I decided to pick on myself, because that's the easiest thing to do. Um, so I have two papers that I'm going to review with you that I published. One was a paper that I published based on some undergraduate research I did as an honors project as a chemical engineer at Florida State University. And in this case, what I wanted to study was LDL transport and deposition in arterial stenoses. And as you can imagine, as an undergraduate, you know, we did a lot of simplification to model this LDL transport problem. So you can see my stenosis geometry on the left-hand side. It's axisymmetric, and it's even symmetric across the, the middle of the stenosis. Uh, we made an assumption. Uh, uh, to get the velocity field, we made this uh, lubrication approximation assumption. So we assume that the, the channel converges very slowly along its length. And in that case, you can kind of explicitly calculate the axial velocity as well as the radial velocity components. And then finally, to predict uh, and come up with an equation for LDL transport, we used an area averaging approach. So in the case of area averaging, what you do is apply that averaging function you see on the upper right-hand side of the slide. And that, that pulls out the radial and theta dependence. Um, you wind up having to go through a lot of mathematics because you come up with an average equation, a closure equation. It's kind of like, you know, for those folks who are, have taken, you know, hydrodynamics, you wind up doing things similar to Reynolds averaging, Navier-Stokes equations. But in the end, I was able to come up with that equation you see on the right-hand side. And at least as an undergraduate, I had no idea how to integrate that thing. So I said, okay, it's time for some numerical analysis. Um, so as kind of a senior in uh, undergrad, I found some Fortran code online. Online even existed way back in 1994, believe it or not. So I found this library, and I came up with those answers you see on the bottom. Uh, going back and looking at this paper, I said, okay, well, let's rate the work that I did. And I have this scorecard here. And in a little while, you'll see uh, why I'm using this specific scorecard. But for now, let's just assume it's a really nice scorecard. And so I went through different elements of verification, validation, and applicability. And so in the case of verification, so things like software quality assurance and numerical code verification, I didn't even know what those were, didn't do that. Uh, for calculation verification, in that case, doing mesh refinement studies, I'm pretty sure I did it, but when I read the paper again, like I couldn't find any evidence of that. And when I thought back as an undergraduate, I was like, did I even know what a mesh refinement study was? I'm not sure, you know? And for whatever reason, the review, nowadays, nowadays you couldn't get through a review without mentioning it or showing some evidence, but back then I guess it didn't come up. I'm gonna give myself a green light anyway. For numerical solver error, didn't know what that was, and user error, yes, I definitely checked over and over again, you know, in my work. Now when it came to validation, you know, for the model form, I didn't investigate. I thought what I did was amazing, and just the fact that I did it as an undergrad was pretty neat, so I was like, why would I change? Uh, for model inputs, I didn't look at any sort of sensitivity, and then uh, on the comparator, I didn't have any um, thing to compare against. It was purely a computational study, more red lights. So then there was nothing to assess. Uh, so finally, at the end, for applicability, uh, relevance to the quantities of interest, well, I really wanted to know what LDL deposition was, and I predicted that, so I got a, finally another green light there. And then finally, when it came to the validation, that didn't exist. So there's a lot of red here is the main takeaway, right? And that was me, Mark Horner, 1994. And so uh, there was, I, I really wondered because, you know, there is this kind of note, you know, that appears in many papers, especially with, uh, you're, when you're using modeling simulation, the model predicts that. We all, we're trained to say that now, right? Um, so I wondered, did I even say that anywhere in the paper <laughs> or did I just take that as a ground truth? 
And I did find in the results, you know, this, this sentence, some caution must be used in the analysis of the quantitative results of this paper since experimental data about the kinetics of the deposition process are not currently available. So apparently the velocity field was perfect, ground truth. Uh, some other things about how the particle moves in the flow, also perfect. It was just the kinetics that was the only problem. <laughs> so when I look back and read this, it's kind of funny. Um, and I'm pretty sure a reviewer made me put that in there, which is completely reasonable. Um, but it was kind of nice to, well, it's kind of funny to look back on this and grade myself and, you know, kind of a little bit humbling as well. Next, let's look at exhibit B. And, you know, I almost took this out. Um, but then after the presentation that we just had, what, what, what happened here? Oh, yeah, after the presentation we just had, where Carmen mentioned chaos, right? I was like, I can't take it out now, right? And so uh, I actually studied chaotic mixing in recirculating flows as, as part of my doctoral work. So in this case, what we did was we had this open cavity flow system. So finally, I decided to do some experiments. And so we had this system where you could do what are called dye advection experiments. So we would inject these colored dyes into the main flow channel that you see, that circular region in the, in the, cha in the um, picture there. And then we, where you see where that red arrow is, the cylinder would rotate according to a program. So we had a stepper motor, and you could tell the motor to rotate however you wanted. You know, steady state, you could do a periodic thing, whatever. And so I did some fluid dynamics, as you can see, on the upper right-hand side there. And, you know, compared that finally against some really nice dye advection experiments. Now, the reason we were studying this is that um, under steady state, there's absolutely zero convective mixing between these two environments. So if you want to enhance transport between the outer flow channel and a recirculating flow region, uh, you know, diffusion isn't going to get you anywhere. That's obviously a very slow process. So the question is, what can we do to enhance that transport? And that's through the introduction of chaos. And when it comes to fluid dynamics, uh, the other, one rule to keep in mind in, in chaos theory in general is you cannot have chaos in two-dimensional systems. It, without effect, cannot exist. You need three dimensions. So in this case, we studied, uh, as one example, what if we varied the cylinder speed? So that center cylinder, again, with the red arrow, now we're, red arrow, now we're gonna accelerate and decelerate that uh, speed using the kind of sawtooth curve that you see there. And what we get now, if we're looking at the dye advection experiments, is a deflection of that separating streamline between that outer channel and the cavity. And we can see how now we have these little parcels of material that are being exchanged between the cavity and the channel after every flow cycle. So we do one flow cycle, we see what happens on the upper right-hand side of that slide. And so then we also get to do the pretty pictures like I show you on the lower right-hand side and make some really nice pictures that show up on covers like Science and Nature. I didn't get one. Every, it felt like everyone else in the lab did. Somehow mine didn't quite make it. But anyway, it was, it was really great research and a lot of fun. But in this case, obviously, I did some computational modeling. And what's really interesting with the computational modeling work that um, we did and what it exposed you know, when studying these systems is that when you look at the instantaneous streamlines on the upper right-hand side of this slide, they don't seem to change much. Like, not much is happening. You know, So it's like, how, how is this even occurring? And so you do see that there is some oscillation. If we zoom way up really closely on that separating uh, streamline area at the mouth of the cavity, we do see that that separating streamline is oscillating somewhat. And so what happens is that you get a separation of what are called stable and unstable manifolds within the, within the recirculating region of the cavity, and it induces this chaos. So even those minor changes in the flow can induce very rapid mixing, like what you see on this slide here. And so on the left-hand side, I show, or in the middle, really, that middle column, I show a comparison between simulation, the really dark pictures, and, or sorry, the experiments, the really dark pictures, and the simulations, the lighter pictures on the right-hand side. And so I could run some validation of those models uh, for a few flow periods. But just like Carmen mentioned before, you start to get this exponential separation of the fluid parcels within the system. And that occurs in these open cavity cases when you see how the material is kind of circulating around. So it starts on that downstream wall in this middle panel here. So it starts on that downstream wall. And then eventually, you see this right here, this is so easy. But the second this load gets back to that downstream point, that's when the exponential stretching starts. And then things go crazy. And it becomes really challenging to model that type of scenario. So I could do maybe five to 10 cycles of the flow, but then I just ran out of accuracy. So the other thing I could do then is look at what happens when uh, time goes to infinity. And so I could do these experiments where I run, say, 100, 100 cycles of the flow and start to identify what are the well-mixed regions where you see a lot of dye on that panel in the upper right, and then areas where you don't see any mixing at all. 
the, the dye is just never going to penetrate those areas. All you're left with at this point now is diffusion. And so those are the unmixed zones. And so we see with the computational model, with a different approach, I can predict what the uh, locations were of those um, well-mixed and mixed regions within the cavity. And so I was pretty excited about that picture over on the upper right, and I still remember the day I kind of overlaid those. I was like, validated. This is amazing, right? So if we go to that scorecard, um, now if we start to go through here, we see a few more green lights. Still, I had no idea what verification was. Uh, I, I actually thought verification and validation were kind of the same thing, and why would I do it twice, <laughs> you know? So I, I didn't, I, once again, didn't really look at software quality assurance or numerical code verification. Definitely did uh, the discretization error, and here I definitely did it. I can remember doing it. There were a lot of, you know, because I was doing a lot of particle tracking type work, not only was I doing mesh refinement studies to look at the velocity field and ensure that was converged, but then because I needed, you know, great accuracy on the particle tracking, I was doing even the, the discretization error study on the particle tracks themselves, which added a lot more refinement uh, to the mesh. Numerical solver error, I, don't, I really don't remember looking at that, so I put a red light, but without a doubt on the use error, you know, seeing where there are errors in the inputs to the computational model, I think for those of us who are especially graduate students out here, um, there was probably 10 different times during my dissertation where I thought I did it all wrong and I reviewed it all and I was like, oh no, it's right, you know. But we've all had that moment for sure. Um, in the validation section, obviously I did some investigation of model form. The model inputs, not so much. When we talk about model inputs in the scorecard, really talking about sensitivity and uncertainty and how that propagates through the model, and I didn't do that. I didn't even know that was possible then. Um, for the comparator, I did a lot of experimental work, and in fact, really the core of my work was experimental and it was supplemented by modeling and simulation. Um, but without a doubt, there's great equivalency in input parameters. You know, we did some nice output comparisons and everything in terms of applicability of the modeling was great. So, you know, over that, you know, seven to eight years, certainly my growth in modeling and simulation and the need for validation, you know, matured. Still, there wasn't really a structure around it, though. This was something where I felt like, okay, you have to validate. You know, you have to do something to show that these uh, models are actually recreating the reality, um, but I wasn't necessarily following a very structured format for that. And so that's when um, actually I started to learn more about, you know, verification and validation and what that's all about, but that was part of my career at ANSYS. Um, so, you know, um, as part of the introduction, as I mentioned, you know, I started off at ANSYS back in 2001. At that time, I was doing mostly support. I was a support guy. Uh, moved into consulting, was doing consulting for a number of years, and then eventually got into what I have as a role now today is business and technology development. And one of my focus areas in that, um, in that role is regulatory. And how do we enable the use of regulatory, or how do we enable the use, sorry, of modeling and simulation as part of regulatory submissions? And so actually the, the formation of the VMV40 group was a really big opportunity for me. And so the challenge is, you know, why, we need, why do we need VMV40? Why do we need validation? And so one of the challenges that we were running into in industry was that, you know, we couldn't answer the question about whether or not a model was sufficiently validated. So, you know, as I mentioned, I was working as a support guy for a while and then getting in consulting. And I would ask customers all the time. I'd just say, hey, you know, we did that work modeling your drug eluting stent or your blood pump or this inhaler. Did you use that data in the submission? And some of them say yes, some would say no. And I was like, well, what happened? And a lot of times they'd say, well, we put it in the submission, and FDA would ask us, is your model validated? And then medical device companies are very conservative when it comes to answering FDA questions. It's kind of like when you're talking to your parent. So they say, well, they'd ask, is it validated? And then, and then the company would say, well, what does that mean? <laughs> right? And then the FDA would say, well, you tell us. <laughs> right? And then the company would say, you know what, just ignore it. Just forget the model and judge us on all that, those traditional sources of evidence. And that's where we were stuck. Like, what does it mean for a model to be sufficiently validated or just validated? You know, what is a validated model when it comes to regulatory review? And so there are a number of, a number of engineers, I can't take credit for this, but there are a number of engineers who were in ASME VMV 10. Um, so the VMV 10 subcommittee was focused on verification and validation for finite element modeling. And they said, you know what, we're in the orthopedic space and we see the value of the, you know, the work products that we're generating when it comes to VMV best practices for finite element analysis. But we have some unique needs in the medical device industry that we think could be addressed you know, with a specialized group focused specifically on medical devices. And as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, there was already, uh, before VMV 40, 
Um, there was already a group focused on nuclear. So I think they were the kind of the pioneers. The nuclear folks said, we want our own group. And then these medical device people said, hey, we'd like our own group as well. And then you can see there are also a number of other uh, topical areas now focused on verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification. And those are related to advanced manufacturing, energy systems, machine learning. There's a brand new one for pharma. It was just approved a few months ago, as well as another brand new one, which I don't have on the slide, for external airframe. And so a number of different communities now are saying, hey, we love the, the core elements of VVUQ, which are in these documents that you see on the bottom, but we need more. You know, we need that specialized for our industry. Something I'd also like to clear up, um, so some folks here, VMV40. And now if you're within the community, you see, and you may even notice on this slide, it says VVUQ40. What's that about? Um, so we changed our name a couple years ago at the standards committee level. And what there was recognition that you know, verification and validation are important, but uncertainty quantification is just as important as VMV. And so we rebranded ourselves as a VVUQ subcommittee, and all the subcommittees now have this name. The VMV40 standard is still called the VMV40 standard because that's how it was published. But the next edition of that will come out as VVUQ40. Um, okay, so hopefully I clear something up. And sometimes I might accidentally say VV40, VVUQ40. It's all the same thing. Okay, so we have this uh, VVUQ40 subcommittee. And you can see the charter is given here on the upper left-hand side of the slide. And some of the motivating factors that we had were, you know, listed on the lower left. You know, we're in this regulated industry with limited ability to validate clinically. Oftentimes, the sources of validation we have aren't necessarily just a bench test. Maybe we want to use clinical imaging or other biomarkers to help validate our computational models, some of which we saw you know, on the from the previous talk. And the use of modeling, as I told with my little story about sufficient credibility in FDA, our use of modeling is hindered by the lack of VMV guidance expectations within the medical device community. And so over a period of years, so, uh, and it was mentioned, I think, in the introduction, but I'm vice chair of the VMV40 subcommittee. And so I'm serving my third term now. Um, it's been a great opportunity for me and a great uh, uh, opportunity for professional development and professional growth. Um, a lot of, if you do ever in industry get the opportunity or even academia to get involved with um, uh, standards development, it is a really nice way to open up your network. Meet new people you wouldn't necessarily meet before, make new friends, and learn something, uh, you know, learn about a new topic in a new way that maybe you didn't consider within your own organization. So I definitely recommend it if that opportunity arises. Okay, so within VMV40, we developed this uh, VMV40 framework. Um, and so what we called it was the Risk Informed Credibility Assessment Framework. We tried our hardest to come up with an easier to remember and cutesy name that would have a cool abbreviation. We just could not do it. So we wound up going with describing it for what it is, risk-informed credibility assessment. And so the goal is to make this connection between the validation requirements around a computational modeling and simulation activity and the risk associated with making decisions based on that model. And so we start off uh, this process. So what I'm going to do over the next several slides then is take you step by step through the VMV40 process. And I, I even heard just a minute ago that, you know, um, I guess VMV40 has been mentioned quite a few times during some of the presentations that were given over the week. So I don't, you know, maybe some little quick summaries of that VMV40 standard. So now let's do a little bit of a deep dive. We'll spend maybe 15 minutes on it. Okay, so first let's talk about uh, the question of interest. So the question of interest describes a, spe a specific deci question, decision, or concern that's being addressed uh, based at least in part on a model. And so your question of interest is not going to be something like, does my device work? Okay, it's, not, it's typically a, a very specific engineering question that you're looking to answer. Something maybe related to a standard. You might be looking at compression bending of a spinal implant. You know, and is that implant meeting the fatigue requirements according to a specific ASTM standard? Um, next, we go to the next box, which is context of use, which defines the specific role and scope of the computational model that's used to inform that decision. And that's in the context of other evidence. That's why we call it a context of use. So we are using a model to answer the question of interest. But you know, typically, we also have evidence from, say, a bench test, an animal test, or a clinical trial that might be augmenting that modeling and simulation result. Uh, and since we're not, not necessarily making that decision based on the model alone, we want to incorporate that into our context of use statement, because that actually helps to de-risk the model. So next step then is to assess model risk, and that's the possibility that we'll make an incorrect decision based at least in part on the results of a computational model. 
And so we divide, divide, subdivide model risk into two different elements, model influence and decision consequence. So model influence, that probably makes perfect sense in terms of what it is. It's the contribution of the computational model uh, relative to the other available evidence. And so um, in this case, if we look at the blue pieces of pie on that x-axis, they represent um, you know, the, the computational model contribution to answering the question of interest. Excuse me. And as you can see, as we go from left to right, that blue piece of the pie gets bigger and bigger. Now, decision consequence is the significance of an adverse outcome resulting from an incorrect decision. And so in the case of decision consequence, it's not typically directly related to the uh, device class, class one, two, or three. But in general, any decision we're going to make about something like a reflex tester, which I show on the bottom, versus a blood pump, which I show on the top, you know, the blood pump's going to have more of a higher risk, you know, uh, higher risk associated with that decision versus something like a reflex tester. So now the next step then is to bring the model influence and the decision consequence together to give us our overall model risk for that modeling and simulation activity. So if we do that for the model used to predict what's uh, some element or engineering aspect of the blood pump versus a reflex tester, what we see is that in this case, even though we're relying very heavily on modeling and simulation to predict the performance of our reflex tester, the overall risk associated with that model is much less than the risk used for the blood pump. And so that's kind of showing how the system works, right? Even We're just using this little sliver of modeling and simulation to help, inform, you know, help give us a little more insight about the pump performance. And we're still going to do that bench test. We're going to you know, put this pump in a flow loop and do some tests. We're going to wind up exposing this to an animal. We may have some clinical data. But still, that's a higher risk model versus what we're doing with that reflex tester. So hopefully that makes sense. The next step then, and this is where you finally get to see why I use that scorecard that I showed you before. The next step then is we have to establish our credibility goals. So credibility refers to the trust and the predictive capability of our computational model. And that's something we need to establish, right? And we do that through the collection of verification, validation, and uncertainty evidence. And so the credit, what we did within the BMV40 subcommittee was to develop a set of credibility factors. And I see just as an aside, I see a few people taking pictures. Anyone who wants to copy this presentation, you can email me or I can share it with you. You can send it to the crowd. It's more than happy to share a PDF of it. So I, I, don't, mind, I don't mind the pictures either, but I'm happy to share a copy of the presentation. Um, so anyway, now we need to establish these credibility goals, okay? So we have credibility factors on the right-hand side of the slide, and what they represent are the constituent elements of verification and validation. They're the little pieces of activities that you have to do to show that your model is sufficiently validated, right, and sufficiently credible. And so we went through a lot of those, you know, when I talked about my uh, own modeling and simulation activities back in my youth, if you will. Um, so we don't need to go into those in too much detail right now. But what I would like to do is, you know, give you a little bit of insight into how those are presented within the standard. Okay, so when it comes to each credibility factor, what we do is we provide a description of that credibility factor in the body of the standard, along with what we call a gradation of activities. Okay, so the goal of the description is just to give you some quick insight into what we expect, what we expect you to cover or consider when you're grading the work that you need to do to satisfy your uh, model credibility for that specific factor, okay? So for numerical code verification, we kind of write in there what we expect you to do. And then the next step then, what you see in the green, bo green box is what we call a gradation of activities. And so that gradation of activities is from a, a listing from low risk to high risk models, what you might do to uh, show that you're meeting a specific risk level. So for example, you know, we talked about before, if you have a low risk uh, scenario, you might ignore numerical code verification. That's an option. You say it's low risk, eh, this is a commercial code, everybody's using it, it's probably fine. Whereas in a high risk scenario, in that case, you might say, wow, I mean, I'm really gonna rely really heavily on the computational model, maybe this is even a class three device. Um, you know, I'm gonna have to rigorously evaluate the accuracy of this code. And so in that case, you might uh, get some benchmark solutions for like parabolic flow in a pipe, or even I've done some work lately with industry on Wormersley flow, and then show that you're getting the correct order of accuracy. For those folks, you know, so for what that means is if you're in, into modeling and simulation, um, you know, we have a rate of convergence that's expected from, our, from a solver, okay? And so for example, in uh, computational fluid dynamics, if you use first order upwinding, then you expect your answer to converge to the analytical solution at a first order rate. If you use second order upwinding, second order rate. 
So we've gone through and shown, you know, for a variety of problems that we can meet that condition. So it's very rigorous. It takes a lot of time, um, but it's something that does allow you to meet those risk levels. So the next step then is to uh, uh, assess your overall model credibility. So, you know, based on the last slide, what you'd have to do is go through and do a credibility factor evaluation for every single factor you see on this slide here, okay? Kind of an A, B, C, D, okay? So after you do that then, you're gonna kind of roll all that up and say, now I have a plan, right? The whole point of VMB40 is not to teach you how to do verification and validation but it's to help you plan your modeling and simulation activities. And it's with that plan then you can make an assessment as to whether or not I'm even, I mean, this model even makes sense to undertake, right? And so what, we, what I have on this slide then is that credibility factor table again. And then I put that risk uh, chart on the top of the slide. And in this case, I put a gold star over low. So this is a low risk scenario, okay? So we're gonna have just maybe a minor model influence for a low risk device. And so everything is low right, in terms of our uh, credibility requirements. And what we see is that for things like code verification, oh wow, now suddenly Mark really likes code verification, it's all the way over to the right and it's in high, you know? So you get some extra credit, add a boy, pat on the back, that's great. Um, if we look at some of the other arrows, you know, we see some hit that medium level, but then also some hit the low. But overall we have, you know, every single credibility factor satisfying that low requirement. And therefore, from a planning perspective, the work that we have to do. We've already established what work needs to be done to undertake this project. And it looks like in the end, if we, we're able to accomplish everything that we plan, we'll have a model that has sufficient credibility. Now, let's say we go over to a medium level. And uh, I didn't change anything. So if you look between the last slide and this slide, none of my planning changed. But now I still have two of those low level factors there, okay? And so the question now is, wow, is this model really sufficiently credible? One of the discussions we often have within the VMV40 subcommittee is like, don't think you can just take an average and that's good enough, right? So for example, if I had half of these factors high and half of the factors low, is that medium? No, I mean, you have too many low factors there. So your model isn't probably gonna have sufficient credibility. Um, another thing to consider too though is which factors are falling short, short. So for example, in this case, discretization error is low. And that means I'm just not gonna do a mesh refinement study, and that's pretty lazy. You know, I don't know how you could come up with scientific rationale for not doing a mesh refinement study. Um, at some areas, you can fall short, though, and come up with a rationale for why that might be acceptable. One of those is under test conditions. So I'm doing some work right now on spinal implant modeling, and it's really interesting. We got into a long discussion on that one because um, in the ASTM standard for fatigue, you know, compression bending of spinal implants, it only defines one test, okay? And then within the VMV40 standard, we went quantitative in terms of qualitative in terms of the, of the credibility factors. So A says you did one test sample. B is you did more than one test sample. And so it's kind of, it automatically locks us into one or an A, which is low risk. So in some of the rewrites that we're talking about now within VMV40, we're talking about doing things like some or all because if an ASTM standard tells us we only have to do one test, and, so, and we only do that one test, really that's all that's required. So now we can suddenly get to that high risk without having any scientific rationale required. Hopefully that makes sense. But anyway, there are cases where scientific rationale can get you out of trouble when a credibility factor falls short. So in this case, we're not sure. You know, you're gonna have to justify some of these choices, um, but overall, you know, the model looks good, but you're going to have some work to do to argue to either your internal stakeholders or external, like FDA, why this model might be okay. Now we've gone to high risk, and this is a disaster, right? And so the, the thing to know here is that through the VMV40 standard, we know this model's a fail. It's not going to work. And if internally at your organization or within your academic group, if you do an evaluation of your project, and say, you know what, this is all we have based on expertise, resource, et cetera, this is all we can do, then you know, you know, maybe I just shouldn't use modeling for this project, and that's okay, right? But the VMV40 standard guides you through that before you ever kind of go down that path. So one slide I came up with recently that I thought might help folks understand how the, the different elements of these first floor blocks of the VMV40 standard fit together is this one. And so we see circle one, two, three, four, if you look on the upper right, represent that question of interest, context of use, model risk, and credibility goals. Okay, so we have the question of interest, right? 
within the question of interest, you're always naming the device that you're interested in. Does my blood pump, whatever that is, right? Automatically, once you mention blood pump, typically, and then you have a question of interest that you're defining some engineering goal, you're, typically what happens within the uh, medical device company is a quality team gets involved and says, this is a decision consequence. They do what's called like a PERT analysis. They look at you know, rate of occurrence and severity, and they figure out this is what's the risk to the patient. And so that question of interest in the end defines the, the decision consequence. And then I mentioned before how context of use is how you're going to use the model in the context of other evidence. So then context of use defines your model influence. Okay? So you bring those two things together and that defines your risk. And then finally, once you have your risk, that pretty much tells you what factors you have to select in the credibility factor analysis. Okay? So hopefully that helps to bring it all together in terms of those first four boxes within the chart. The next step then is uh, in the framework is to actually establish a VMV plan and execute on that plan. And as I mentioned before, the VMV 40 standard does not tell you how to validate models. It doesn't tell you how to do uncertainty quantification. It doesn't tell you how to you know, run Monte Carlo and get an uncertainty bound for your model or estimate. You know, um, no, anyway, it, does, it just doesn't go through those various processes. And that's where we rely heavily on ASME VMV 10 and 20. And personally for me, VMV 20 is the one. Like it just lays out procedurally, whoops, it lays out procedurally all the things that you need to do in terms of verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification. It's very well written in my, in my own perspective and very helpful in terms of, it's, I've learned a lot from that standard. And the next step then is to assess the credibility of the computational model. Okay, so we had a plan. We executed on the plan, and that, that next step is to assess and decide whether or not our model is sufficiently credible. So, you know, in theory, if we're able to accomplish everything that we said, then yes, that should be the case, but you still have to go through this procedure. And we went through a lot of discussion within the VMV40 standard about whether or not we should make just a very simple chart like this, and we decided we should, and it's not because, you know, if you go through the chart, I'm not sure if everybody can read it, but it says at the top, you completed your activities and the rectangular box says review everything. And then that you know, decision box says, is the model credible? Mm -hmm. Yes, great, go document. Uh, no is, you know, do we abandon it? That is an option, you might say yes, okay, give up. But it was really that branch on the left-hand side where the no branch, where you know, we try to recognize the fact that you know, verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification are iterative processes, especially in new applications where you may not be familiar with how to validate that model or you just don't have the internal expertise, you're gonna go through the cycle of VVUQ numerous times before you get it right. And so that's what we were trying to highlight with that no branch is, I don't know what's going on, with that no branch is that you know, this can happen and we, what we wanted to provide was a way to kind of make sure that folks understood not only is verification validation and certainty quantification iterative, but also the VMV40 process. So for example, let's say we decide at the end that, well, I was able to accomplish most of the credibility activities, but on one I fell short. One option for you might be to, you know, try and invest more in the computational model or the validation activities. Another option might be to increase the level of reliance on things like bench or animal testing. And you say, you know what, I'll just take the model as it is but I can reduce my overall model risk and shift left by increasing the influence of other sources of evidence, okay? And that's the little bit of discussion that we wanted to have within that section. Okay. So it likes to go forward when I don't want to, but then not when I want to. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, so then the last step is uh, documentation and evidence. And so in this case, you know, we got bailed out by the FDA. Um, so as we were developing the VMV40 standard, there was a group that's kind of looking at, okay, how do we document the model? What do we summarize, et cetera? And then lo and behold, in 2014, and then uh, the final version of this guidance came out in 2016, the FDA, pub the FDA published a guidance document called Reporting of Computational Modeling Studies and Device Submissions. And what they laid out in there was what they called a computational modeling and simulation report. And so what you can read the sections on the right-hand side, but what FDA was struggling with was that uh, you know, medical device companies were submitting you know, modeling and simulation data and they were leaving things out or they were including extra information and there was a lot of inconsistency in terms of the information, not only what was being submitted but in the way it was organized. 
And that was creating a lot of challenges. And in fact, folks were kind of starting to say, well, FDA, you just don't know if they'll accept the model, right? Um, one really interesting observation that came out of the FDA is they did a metadata study on um, spinal implant submissions between 2014 and 2019. And what they found was that only 15% of those submissions included a mesh refinement study, which is pretty scary to think about. Like, why wouldn't you just throw that in, you know? Um, so anyway, through this guidance document, what FDA said is if there's more consistency in the modeling and simulation summaries that are coming into the center, then we hope there will be more predictability and consistency in the review of that modeling and simulation information. So the goal now really is just to fill out, you know, those different sections of your modeling and simulation uh, uh, activity that you performed, and through that then hopefully you'll be able to get that through the FDA. Uh, one of the last things I'll cover with the VMV40 standard are the il illustrations and examples that we included. Um, illustrations are like call-out boxes within the main body of the standard. So they're little illustrations, you know, kind of like if you're an undergraduate calculus and you learn about the mean value theorem and then there's this quick kind of definition example, right? And that's what we tried to put there. Just to give a quick insight, you know, as you're reading through the standard, what, what do we mean? But then we included a number of examples at the back of the um, document in Appendix B. And there, again, you know, after having six years develop, developing the standard, um, you know, we had gained a lot of insight in our own internal community as a VMV40 standard community. But what we recognized is there's a lot of external folks who had no idea what we're talking about. And so what we wanted to summarize within those examples at the end was, you know, here's how you could apply this standard. Here are different use cases. Here are different contexts of use. Uh, we applied it to a variety of different medical devices, different physics, et cetera. So really trying to transfer some of that thinking and knowledge that we had gained as our own community out into industry. So one takeaway from this portion of the presentation then is that you know, when it comes to using modeling and simulation and regulatory submissions, and I think anywhere where you're making, you know, uh, um, uh, decisions based on a model that are also related to things like patient safety as well, um, you know, the quite, when you use uh, VMV 40 standard, that's going to tell you how much VMV you have to do. Uh, when you use then the VMV 10, 10.1, and 20 standards, that tells you how to do that VMV. And then finally, when you want to summarize your model, that's the FDA guidance. And what you can see at the bottom then, if this decides to cooperate with me, is that you can see direct linkages between these different sections and then the VMV40 standard itself. So what I try to do is just take some of those, that, that risk-informed credibility assessment framework and place it beneath those different documents. So that's how they all fit together. Okay, so then the last thing I'd like to talk about, what's the future? You know, where are we headed when it comes to good simulation practice? And in this case, what I thought I'd do is uh, look at a few different community initiatives that are ongoing right now and talk about, you know, how they are helping to support, uh, you know, good simulation practice and the global adoption of modeling and simulation. Um, one of the challenges that we are facing as an industry is that we have a lot of predictability around the use of modeling and simulation with the FDA, but the second we leave the U.S., we fall off a cliff. It's a real problem. And so, you know, because of that then, a number of medical device companies have said, well, if I know I have to generate XYZ evidence that I've always generated uh, for Japan, China, et cetera, not throwing any stones at them or anything, but if I know with predictability I can use that data and there's uncertainty around the use of modeling and simulation data with those agencies, then I'm going to maybe tend to fall back on the use of the, those traditional sources of data as part of my regulatory strategy instead of using modeling and simulations. So that's become a little bit of a barrier and something we're trying to address. And one of the ways and one of the organizations that's helping to address that is the Avachena Alliance. Um, so the Avachena Alliance obviously has a very tight connection with VPH, so probably most of the folks in the room know who Avachena is. Um, there is an international working group that's uh, in the Avachena Alliance, and that's led by, it was just taken over by Natalie Varag, if I'm uh, pronouncing her name correctly, I haven't met her yet. Um, she's from Medtronic. And then I'm reporting to her as the lead of the Global Harmonization Task Force. And within the GHTF, what we're looking to do is engage directly different regulatory agencies around the world and make them aware of the modeling and simulation opportunity that exists today and also the benefits of modeling and simulation. And so, you know, through that then, we're doing some level of lobbying for a globally harmonized approach, but in our case, that lobbying is really one-to-one, -one, going to those regulators and, you know, kind of advertising the benefits of modeling and simulation, as I mentioned before. Uh, 
Um, we're also working with the IMDRF. So for those of you who don't know, IMDRF represents the International Medical Device Regulatory Forum, or Regulators Forum. And so that's a coalition of, I think, 19 or 20 different regulatory agencies around the world. It's the big ones, you know, your US, Japan, China, Brazil, uh, EU, obviously, UK, et cetera. And so they, they kind of collaborate oftentimes and write uh, reports or kind of guidance documents, if you will, that outline best practices. And so we're lobbying for a modeling and simulation uh, guidance document coming from IMDRF. And in fact, the Avachen Alliance was just invited to the last IMDRF meeting that took place in Brussels. Next year, IMDRF is meeting in the U.S., so really hoping we can potentially get, you know, even just a, a speaking role at one of those meetings um, and kind of start to make some momentum towards that standard or guidance document. One of the milestones we accomplished as a group was the glo uh, Global Harmonization Position Paper. One of the things that we were, it was really funny, you know, um, within our own community, we kept telling ourselves, well, the global harmonization is BMV 40 in that FDA guidance document. But I can't walk up to someone from the Danish authority and say BMV 40 in FDA guidance document, and he or she's just going to run off and read those and then just say, oh, wow, yeah, that just makes total sense, right? So what we identified with our group, the GHTF, and actually what really, that's, this is what really got us started as a subgroup uh, within the international working group, was to write this position paper. And in this case, what we did was just to take some of the key elements out of the VMV 40 standard. You know, it's an 80-page standard. It's not something you just hand a regulator and just say, yeah, enjoy. And so what we did was try and take some of the key elements out of that standard, as well as the reporting standard, and put some of the kind of GSP-type things into this position paper, but it's something much easier to digest. And now when we do our outreach program with the, um, you know, the global regulators, you know, we share this position paper instead of trying to share standards and other more technical documents. My PowerPoint has told me to go on the next slide, which I'll now do. Um, you know, one thing that's been really interesting in terms of our outreach is that I, I've learned a lot about you know, some of the modeling and simulation acceptance that's kind of already out there and we were blind to. Um, one thing that's really interesting with the uh, Japanese authority is I found this presentation by someone from the authority who said, you know, they use the U.S. as a benchmark. And they say in the U.S. we have this examination period on that top row, excuse me, and then uh, there's some application lag where, you know, the U.S. Uh, uh, medical device manufacturer is waiting to apply to Japan. And then there's an examination period which is even longer than the U.S. period. And so what they call it is device lag. They already had their own kind of uh, terminology for that. And so based on some of these observations, they formed some committees that were focused on modeling and simulation. And in fact, doing a little bit of digging, I was able to find that they had some practices around you know, acceptance of orthopedic modeling and modeling and simulation in general. Um, what's interesting with Japan is, and this is common throughout most of the regulators outside the United States, there is no science lab in Japan. There's also no science lab in the EU for devices. There's not one in the UK, Brazil, et cetera. No one else has a science lab except for the FDA. And so uh, a lot of the different regulatory agencies around the world actually rely on the academic institutions to provide the regulatory science that they need and that knowledge that they need to help guide the best practices when it comes to accepting new technology. I don't know which is better or worse or which one is slower or faster, but you know, that's the ecosystem that we're working within within these other geographies. So we're doing our best and we'll see how it goes. What is really exciting is that some of the authors of those white papers recently visited Marco Vichconti at the University of Bologna. And uh, we kind of held a, you know, a full day uh, seminar talking about the benefits of modeling and simulation. We'll see where that goes. Um, but for now, you know, that level of outreach is pretty high and we have some nice momentum. Australia is really interesting. They have this modeling and simulation framework of related standards. So I found this, again, just doing digging online. And what's interesting is physics-based models is like a line item in the midst of 150 other things. So I'm still trying to learn more um, about this. I've sent quite a few emails, and no one has chosen to reply to me. So we'll see where that goes. And China actually has a, um, a standard that was published a few years ago uh, focusing on FEA best practices for orthopedic implants. And you know, with Japan and China, it's really hard to find these types of documents. You really have to talk to someone within the region because all this stuff's typically in Chinese. So even in the case of the Chinese document, um, one of my medical device colleagues found it and had it translated, and then he shared the translated version with me. Okay, going on to another group. This is the Credible Practice of Modeling and Simulation in Healthcare group. 
Um, this group was formed by the uh, Inner Agency Modeling and Analysis Group, as well as the Multi-Scale Modeling Group uh, uh, within the U.S. And one of the things that the NIH noticed was that uh, there were a number of modeling and simulation activities, potentially with clinical impl implications, that were being funded by the NIH. And a lot of great uh, uh, research and advancements were being made based on that grant, uh, you know, the grant, uh, the call, you know, the grant work that was being performed. But there was a lack of translation of that data to the clinic. So scientists were doing a lot of great work, maybe creating models and maybe something was going into a SimTK or a Wiki or whatever like that. But the true adoption of that technology and the translation of that te technology into industry just wasn't happening, right? So, you know, you have two choices there. Do we stop funding this work or we get into the translational science realm and start to see what can we do to establish some best practices to help those scientists engage with clinicians and other researchers to get this type of modeling and simulation framework out into real world use. And so I'm also uh, on the executive committee for the CPMS team, a recent publication, and it's hyperlinked on the upper right. All, uh, most of the documents in here are hyperlinked, so when I share the PDF, you can click on them and just go to the original source. Um, but we published a paper called 10 Simple Rules. In this case, what we did was to um, perform first uh, an internal uh, survey and figure out what we thought were the best practices associated with modeling and simulation. We came up with 36 rules, if I remember correctly. And then we went out to the external community and through a survey said, okay, what are the top, you know, basically everyone vote for your top 10. And the top 10 are the ones that are shown here. I'm running out of time, so I don't really have time to go through each one one by one. Um, but, you know, um, this is something where if you go to the original source, I definitely recommend you check it out. The last example I'll talk about then is really more, a little more directly connected to GSP, and it's the In Silico World Green Paper. Um, so I already mentioned Marco Vicconte, based out of University of Bologna. Um, and then also a colleague, Luca, Luca Milli, who's from In Silico Trials, and one of his colleagues will be speaking right after me. Um, so they joined forces to uh, drive the development of this green paper. And in this case, what they did was to look for authors of uh, 10 different chapters that were elements of good simulation practice. Uh, once those lead authors were identified and then, you know, volunteers could come from the in silico world community to help in the develop, come to a consensus, you know, on each of the given, given topics. So probably no big surprise, you see a chapter five called model credibility. So I was one of the editors for that chapter. But there are a number of different other topics that we covered in there that go far beyond uh, verification, validation, uncertainty, quantification. So things like health technology assessment, I didn't even know what that was, you know. So it was really interesting to kind of learn more about you know, some of the different elements and vectors that we need to follow when we start to think about uh, good simulation practice and the use of modeling and simulation, how eventually it connects to the safety of humans and how, and also reimbursements, et cetera. So this is a document right now where we just completed it two weeks ago. It has now been sent off to Springer and will be formatted as an open access book. Um, Springer will probably take a few months, you know, to kind of go through that process of formatting and editing, et cetera. So really hoping by the end of the summer this document will be available. And again, it's open access, so click and download. Okay, that's it. So just about right on time. Uh, conclusions, you know, what we're seeing is that the risk and rewards for using computational modeling and simulation are quickly increasing. You know, as I mentioned before, things like in silico trials, virtual humans, surgical planning, clinical decision making, all these are increasing the risk associated with using a model. Um, but we do have an accepted regulatory, I keep saying regulatory, we have an accepted regulatory framework for the use of modeling and simulation and how to establish the credibility requirements around that model. And I think what I'm hearing, you know, over the course of the week, that folks are make, mentioning that outside of just, hey, I want to use this with the FDA, right? So I'd like to say that we have this really nice framework in terms of ASME standards that can help guide the credibility of computational models that are used for whatever research you're doing. Um, and then good simulation practice can obviously help with the, establish the credibility of the computational modeling and simulation on a number of other vectors outside the VVUQ space. So let's start practicing. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Mark, for this very nice presentation. Uh, there are questions in the audience for Mark? Uh, 
hello, thank you for the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question about um, the VV10, for example, or VV20. Does uh, using commercial software guarantee me that, at least in terms of the code verification, uh, I'm fine? And what if I write my own code? How would it be and how could I pass it? How yeah. could I get certified? Yeah, so for the commercial software, it again, it comes back always to that risk, right? Um, in some cases, you can kind of de you know, maybe potentially even ignore the code verification. I'm not a fan of that um, because personally for me, I find there's two benefits of code verification. One is that you ensure that the code is working on the platform that you're using, all right? So I took the code, I downloaded it from whatever website, and I installed it on my platform, and it's working correctly. But two, what I'm finding more and more is that code verification can also help to teach the user how to use the code correctly. And so the example I'll give you is for this Wormersley flow problem. So if you're not familiar with that, it's like a pulse little flow in a pipe. And it's, uh, you know, idealized the point where you just have a straight tube and a, not, not a Newtonian viscosity and you just have a steady state solution, you know, a periodic solution for that flow. And so um, there's a community or a group of us within the VMV40 standard working in this Wormersley flow problem. And uh, there was one group, uh, so I, I did it, you know, did the code verification, I was using Fluent. And there's another group also using Fluent. And so they just said, every time I get the wrong answer, wrong answer, wrong answer, wrong answer. And, and you need a, a UDF, a user function, to apply that periodic velocity at the inlet. So I just sent them mine. I'm like, oh, now it works, <laughs> you know? And so they, there was a mistake in their code and they finally figured it out. They compared theirs line by line to mine. It's a really simple UDF. And they're like, oh, we found the problem. They swore they had it right. But they didn't. So they learned a lesson. How do I use this code correctly? Okay, so that's my soapbox around code verification. Okay, so now when it comes to um, you know commercial code versus in-house code, the same rules apply. You know, if you write your own in-house code and it's a low-risk scenario, um, maybe you don't have to do code verification. But as that risk increases, then you're going to be required to do the code verification according to the VMB standard. Yeah, so it really comes down to the risk associated with that model and then your, also your comfort level in terms of the code that you've used. I will say, though, that you know, uh, using a commercial code, one, I think you know, most of us in the room are probably more comfortable using the commercial code because so many people are touching it, especially the more popular codes, right, that you feel like you know, probably if there was a bug in laminar flow in a code like you know, star CCM plus, someone would have found that by now, right? Um, but... The other thing I'll say is that FDA too, you know, I was just at a VMV meeting the other day and someone, I'm not going to name names, they're like, well, if it's a commercial code, I mean, it's probably okay. And I was like, hey, can you say that again? I'm like pulling my phone out. So when it comes to commercial code, it's definitely, there's a little more trust there just because of the large user base. So there, you probably would get more scrutiny um, when it comes to your own in-house code, but there's no reason why you can't use it. Yeah. We even list it explicitly within the VMV 40 standard. We talk about off the shelf code modified off-the-shelf code where you put a UDF and then your in-house or custom code. So it's all part of the same bucket. Yeah. So, thank you. Yep. So one, one row down. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, and uh, this is super interesting and super important. And uh, I think it should also propagate to the scientific uh, community. Yeah. Uh, we, we should really start to use this much more widespread as well. Uh, so I have a question. I would like to do a sort of mock submission uh, just to sort of uh, learn all of the steps of it and also sh show to ourselves and potential customers and collaboration partners and so on that that uh, we know how to do it and the, and the benefits and so on. How 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 do you <laughs> how do you start uh, doing such a thing? So. It, when you say mock submission, do you really want to do one to the FDA or you just want to kind of work on one? Because FDA does do mock submissions, but typically you would be invited somehow and an FDA mm. person would be included in that group. Yeah. And so how the mock submission works is, um, so I did one for that virtual patient model I mentioned mm -hmm. before. And in that case, we had there was a group of FDAers on that project mm. who helped to develop, you know, the different applications to the FDA. So in that case, there was an engineering model summary and a statistical model summary, and then it was submitted to the center just through normal channels, and then sent to teams within the FDA who reviewed both of those applications mm. and provided feedback. They did not know 
this was a mock submission oh. until they came into the room and found out, oh, well, it was a mock thing. Okay. You know? But they were blinded to the fact it was a mock submission. So it was pretty rigorous in terms of that process. Mm. Um, the other word we use sometimes, which you might find helpful, is end-to-end example. Um, mm. So there is an end-to-end example I'm working on right now with a couple folks from FDA and then people in industry, and we're doing one for that uh, compression bending testing for the F1717 standard for a spinal implant. So that's one, too, where if you were interested in doing and we're doing every step. We're doing the experiments. We're doing the simulations. We're filling out the VMV40. Mm. Uh, we've done it all. We even did hierarchical validations. We published one paper already on how to model rods, mm. and now we're modeling the full assembly. And all this is going either into journal verification validation and uncertainty quantification or the journal, hopefully, ORS is where we're submitting it, or ORS, ORS yeah, spine. Mm. And so um, these are... Uh, this is another option, you know, so mm. if that's something you're interested in, you know, depending on the area, someone like myself or someone else from VMV 40 could potentially jump in as like an expert and help with that. So, yeah. 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 So, so uh, I mean, there are different uh, uh, applications. Some, some would be, would be, would be within software development and e-health applications, mm -hmm. but I'm also collaborating quite closely with, with drug development companies. And, and there we, are talking about doing a, a sort of submission of an already approved drug to mm -hmm. see could we have submitted this with the use of modeling? What would the, the steps have entailed and how much would it have benefited or uh, right. yeah. worse in the case? Uh, but uh, uh, what's the sort of first step to uh, to uh, initiate such a... Yeah, so for the mock submission, I don't know. I mean, there's a couple of folks at FDA who work in the OINDP space, so like nasal drugs, you know. Mm -hmm. So there already have, has been some work on applying the VMV40 standard to predicting mm -hmm. PVPK model accuracy for inhaled drugs. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, some really nice work that they actually funded. Mm -hmm. um, but for initiating a mock submission, um, you know, we'd have to maybe approach one of those people and see if that was possible. Yeah. yeah. So there's a couple of people that come to mind. But yeah. for oral, like pure oral drugs where you're, it's a pill, yeah. you know, I don't know. I just don't know. That's a whole different group, and I'm not as well connected. If there's not a device there, I'm mm -hmm. just not quite, or like a big manu a big tank for manufacturing, I'm not as well connected to the, those folks. We yeah. can talk about it, yeah, if you want to. Yeah, okay, okay, cool. Thanks. Yep. One more question, yeah. Thank you, Mark. I mean, uh, as Jordan has said, we've been working for the last two years within the Syncardio Test European project on this VMV UK40. Uh, for fluid simulations related to left atrial appendage occluder devices. And, I mean, we didn't know what it was when we started, really. And, and sometimes it's really discouraging because it's, <laughs> it, it can be an infinite work. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, there is always a new parameter, a new modeling uh, uh, alternative to test. And when you have done hundreds of simulations for a mesh convergence, time step convergence, you realize, OK, I've done it with Newtonian fluid. And now there are a couple of papers that appear two months ago saying that maybe you need to go to non-Newtonian. And then I need to repeat all the experiments again. Yeah. And sometimes we have the feeling that the methodological progress goes a lot faster than all you need to cover all these steps. and and. Sometimes it's super frustrating. And what it happens is you see, okay, well, scientists, well, I start just validating or partially validating, not covering all aspects, and but having good insights on how to make the models progress. But then you feel that there is a lack of initiatives, not only to set up the standards and the rules, but for the benchmark, for the benchmark data, to have yeah. repositories where everyone can know to go there and, and, the, and, and promote that people are putting this data for everyone to share. So I would like to know your, your opinion on, on all this. No, aspects. I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, we've gotten quite a lot, I'll just say productive uh, criticism, I guess, um, and the observations from industry are that we've set a high bar, yeah. And in fact, a high bar relative to bench testing, where bench testing now is accepted as a ground truth, right? And so if you follow the standard, okay, you're good to go, right? And even in the previous talk, I noticed with Carmen, she talked about the animal model and said, you know, our animal model that predicted plasma uh, cytopenia or something, if I remember correctly, it's not very good, right? But that's the ground truth. So if you submit that, then everybody believes it. And then when you go to this other system, it's like, so I do agree with you that 
we're in a transition phase where it's really challenging. And even this code verification piece is a real problem. And I feel like um, there's some things we can do as providers to help that. So for example, architecting our code to be more amenable to code verification and making these code verification examples more readily available. Um, but then also a lot of the VVUQ activities that are required. Um, so for example, you know, for those of you who do use ANSYS, we have this cool little worksheet where you can run parametric studies. You can't do anything with the worksheet. Like I'd like to take the results coming in that worksheet and calculate an uncertainty. I can't do anything with that data. I have to go into Excel. So I think we have a long way to go in terms of architecting our tools to be more supportive of VVUQ. And that comes at you know, all the stages. So I agree you know, on multiple levels. One, we set a high bar. And two, yeah, the tools need help in terms of what they provide. Yeah, And then the information, like you said, for code verification. I think most providers provide code verification. We have packages that folks can use to kind of automate that code verification process as well. But they're not free. You know? So if you want to do it yourself, there's some examples we have in the manual, but you have to kind of set all that up. And yeah, I mean, code verification in and of itself is a never ending. You can always change the element type, the solver type, and every combination of those, right? So you really have to start. The, the key to code verification is saying what part of this, what parts of the solver am I going to touch and just focus on those, right? Otherwise, you'll, you can't vet verify the entire solver. That's our job, right? Anyway, uh, I, I feel your pain. Yeah. And a lot of other people do. <laughs> We, can, we have to leave it here. So let's thank our speaker again. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.